The root of our climate problem is that there's just too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So wouldn't it be great if we could just put that carbon somewhere else? Now you might have heard of carbon capture and storage or carbon dioxide removal, which are techniques that promise to do just that. Now they don't get us off the hook, they certainly aren't an excuse to keep burning more oil, but there are some situations where they might be useful. Anyway, there's a lot of talk about them, so we thought it was time to dig into what's really happening in the world of carbon capture. Welcome to The Fully Charged Show. Like The Fully Charged Show? Then you will love our six live shows being held around the world in 2023, starting with Sydney, Australia on March the 11th and 12th. Carbon in the atmosphere is the big bad wolf of our time. There is too much of it up there and we're still emitting more. And we know where it's coming from. Almost all of it is coming from fossil fuels. And so the focus needs to be on finding alternative energy sources. And that's what the energy revolution is all about. But there are some industries such as shipping that are gonna take a long time to decarbonize. And we're running out of time to avoid the worst effects of climate change. So maybe collecting some of that carbon along the way could help us out during the transition period. Now, before we really get into the details of this, we need to be really clear about what we're talking about. There are lots of confusing abbreviations in this area. The first big distinction is between CCS and CDR. CCS stands for carbon capture and storage, or sometimes carbon capture and sequestration. CDR is carbon dioxide removal, and the others all fall into one of those two categories. Carbon capture and storage captures carbon dioxide at its source, for example, at the factory where you burn oil or make cement. The carbon dioxide is captured as soon as it's produced, so it should never reach the atmosphere. Instead, it's stored somewhere else, for example, underground. But current CCS techniques only capture around 50 to 68% of the carbon dioxide produced, and so some is still emitted. CCU and CCUS are types of CCS. CCU refers to carbon capture and utilisation, and in this case, at least some of the captured carbon is used in an industrial process that needed carbon dioxide anyway. Any leftovers can be stored. The other big category is CDR, carbon dioxide removal. This removes carbon that's already in the atmosphere. Direct air capture, or DAC, is a type of carbon dioxide removal, where chemical techniques are used to suck carbon dioxide directly from the air. You still need to store this carbon somewhere to make sure it doesn't escape back to the atmosphere. Another type of carbon dioxide removal is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BECS. The carbon here is taken up by plants as they grow, and then that biomass, perhaps agricultural or forestry waste, or crops grown to use as fuel, is burned to produce energy, and the resulting carbon is captured. This is effective, but it would take a huge amount of land to grow enough plants to scale it up. And so none of these techniques are yet 100% effective, none of them are easy to scale up, and all of them come with a hefty price tag. So let's start with CCS, carbon capture and storage. So this is where you go to the cement works or the steel works, wherever carbon is being produced, and you collect the carbon there so it never gets into the atmosphere. Well, there are just a handful of demonstration CCS plants running in the world at the moment. And a study in 2022 found that they were mostly only capturing about 50% of the amount of carbon that had been planned. So it does work, but it doesn't work very well yet. And then we come to the energy cost involved, because it's estimated that a power plant that's running CCS is using 10 to 40% of the electricity it produces just to run the CCS process. So that makes that electricity far more expensive when it goes out into the rest of the world. So this whole thing is a little bit more complicated than it appears on first glance. Okay, that, you know, how do we capture carbon dioxide, let's say, from, from point sources, uh, from a gas-fired power plant? The technology to do that exists for decades now. Uh, we know how to capture, you know, from ammonium plant, from gas-fired power plants, CO2. Uh, there are different technologies, you know, it can be done with membranes, it, it can be done with chemical-like uh, like, uh, amines. 
so there are a kind of substances or membranes that capture CO2. The capture itself, you know, let's call it an absorption on the membrane, is re relatively cheap and easy. But then to desorb it, you know, from any capture media, that costs energy. So, in you know, that's why, you know, the capture process is the most expensive process, and the, the most energy intensive project. A process and what is happening you know in r d is these technologies are getting improved and better and better and better so the efficiency of these technology is increasing rapidly and if you capture the carbon what what happens to it next where does it go we should store that CO2 back into the geologic subsurface. So we have geologic reservoirs. Think about oil and gas came from the subsurface, from geologic reservoirs. There is pore space in, in, in these reservoirs. Uh, uh, and, and that's where we can inject actually the CO2 that is captured. And we store it geologically in these reservoirs. And how sure can we be that those reservoirs aren't going to leak? You know, it sounds very nice to put it down there. How do we know it's not going to come back up? Uh, yes. Uh, why is CO2 not coming back, you know, from these reservoirs? Because we are sure, you know, that these reservoirs basically have a, an impermeable cap rock on top of, of, of them. And, you know, the CO2 stays down there uh, 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 and, and cannot, you know, come back to, to the surface. So then we get to whether any of this is even worth it. Well, a 2019 study concluded that if you compare a power plant with CCS with just investing in renewables, including all the storage and whatever you need to deal with the intermittency, it's still more worthwhile just to invest in the renewables. But this isn't just about energy. Imagine, for example, that you've got a cement works and what it's doing is building what you need to build wind turbine foundations. So you probably want to keep that cement works running, but you can collect the carbon before it does any damage. But given all of that, why is anyone even thinking about power stations with CCS? Well, the answer is actually in the latest IPCC report in the section of mitigation, um, section 4, C4.4, and it says this, Limiting global warming to 2 degrees C or below will leave a substantial amount of fossil fuels unburned and could strand considerable fossil fuel infrastructure. Depending on its availability, CCS could also allow fossil fuels to be used longer, reducing stranded assets. And so there you have it. That's why the oil companies are pushing CCS. It's because it allows them to continue burning oil, which is what they're set up to do, whether or not it's any good for the rest of us. So there is another much more controversial option here, one that leaves a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, and it's called enhanced oil recovery. Oil companies would absolutely love this to be counted as CCS. And here's how it works. When it's hard to extract oil from a well, and this happens at the moment, it's quite a common technique to inject gas somewhere else to push the oil towards the pump and carbon dioxide can do that job and in fact it's already a standard technique this is a proven thing it definitely works and then the carbon dioxide stays down and so it's it's stored away from everything else so oil companies are saying well let us do this with captured carbon dioxide and then what we're actually doing is just storing carbon dioxide but of course, they're only extracting oil to burn it. And actually, it's more than that, because this technique allows them to keep using wells that would otherwise be uneconomic. And studies on whether the whole thing actually stores more carbon than it produces don't produce a clear answer. So the benefits aren't really clear anyway. What is clear is that going down this route involves trusting oil companies to be good actors. And that is not something they have a good track record on. And surely we should just be aiming to stop oil production completely. But there is another reason for considering CCS, and this is also in the IPCC report. One of the things that report talks about is 1,200 different scenarios for what might happen in the future, where our energy comes from, how industry works, all these different methods for emitting carbon. And the conclusion it comes to is that the only scenarios that keep global warming below 2 degrees C by the year 2100, all of them involve some kind of carbon capture. So the message here is that we absolutely need a drastic reduction in fossil fuel use, but in order to avoid the worst effects, we need something else as well. 
So let's take a look at the other option, CDR or carbon dioxide removal. And this is where the net in net zero comes from. The idea is that we could emit some carbon over here, but if we take it out of the air, then the net effect is zero. We effectively haven't emitted any carbon. And this could also help us with reducing historical emissions. So is this one going to help us? Uh, you know, CDR uh, technologies work, I mean, looking at, you know, uh, uh, different ones work really well, no? So, uh, that, for example, direct air capture, we have uh, the world's few first plants uh, operating. You know, the biggest plant is right now operating in, in, in Iceland. You know, it's from a company, Climbergs. It takes a modest, you know, 4,000 uh, uh, ton of CO2 per year out of the atmosphere. Uh, I say modest, but obviously there are the plans of scaling, you know, direct air capture uh, 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 with, you know, these this, this machines. And, you know, there are already plans, you know, to, to uh, in Iceland, for example, 36,000 uh, metric tons per year. But that really shows uh, a kind of the problem. We have to rapidly scale up, you know, these CDR methods. Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, the, the urgency of mitigating, you know, global warming, climate change is, is just just huge. And, you know, the technologies are, are kind of still at the beginning, you know, uh, and, and we have to scale them up. In addition, you know, land-based methods like enhanced weathering, wetland uh, uh, restoration for, for more natural storage, soil carbon, you know, it needs huge huge amount of of land no so area so this is this is really important no the scaling up is 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 very very important and uh, we are lacking in in that you know we we have to speed up things with uh, you know uh, nature based methods like afforestation soil carbon uh, 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 or coastal you know blue carbon restoration of wetlands obviously you know you need a lot of land you know to do that to to scale it up uh, but you know more important is that we need methods on different scales and different you know permanence of 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 the co2 storage to really address you know the big this big, big issue of, of, of climate change. Over the years, we've added a lot of extra carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels and also by changing land use. What we'd really like to do is take the atmosphere back in time to a period when it didn't have as much carbon dioxide in it. And in principle, we could do that by removing carbon from the air, which would act a bit like a time machine. Here's how our conceptual time machine works. If we removed one gigaton of carbon dioxide, that would take us back nine days. H&M, the second largest international clothing retailer, recently purchased 10,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide removal from a company called Climeworks. 10,000 tonnes sounds like a lot, but it's a time machine that takes us back only eight seconds. The recent Inflation Reduction Act in the USA includes funding to develop four regional direct air capture hubs. Each one must have the capacity to remove a minimum of 1 million metric tonnes of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every year. But each one of these exciting new prototypes is a time machine that takes us back only about 13 minutes for each year of operation. And they don't even exist yet. Everyone has heard that planting trees can help. So let's imagine that every single person on Earth planted one tree every year. That would be 8 billion trees per year. But that would take us back just one day and 20 hours, assuming that we could find the space to put all the trees, and that every single tree survived, and that we could afford to wait 20 years for the trees to grow and capture all the carbon. Although, of course, plenty of ecosystems would benefit from having more trees. The time machine is really useful to get a sense of perspective, and we can see that scaling up current techniques enough to make a real difference is a huge challenge. It's far easier to stop carbon being added to the atmosphere than it is to take it away once it's there. It's a bit like the risk of a child running around throwing flour all over your house. The best approach is to lock away the bag of flour before they get started, rather than clearing up the mess afterwards. And it's actually the case that we've never removed a pollutant at scale, ever. 
We've only ever shut down the sources and then let nature do the clearing up. And maybe with carbon dioxide, it's going to be the same. So where does all of this leave us? Well, it's clear that any reduction in the carbon we put in the atmosphere is going to help. But the problem is fossil fuels and we still have to decarbonize. The major task is to stop using fossil fuels completely. CDR and CCS do not change that but they could help us limit the damage we do right in the last hardest bit of decarbonisation. They're not ready to go right now and they won't necessarily scale up. But we don't need to wait for them. The big task ahead of us is getting rid of fossil fuels and we do already have the technologies to do that. The renewable energy technologies are right there. We just have to get on with making that process as quick as possible.